Chapter 10 of The Iron Heel by Jack London This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Saw The Vortex Following like thunderclaps upon the businessmen's dinner occurred event after event of terrifying moment, and I, little I, who had lived so placidly all my days in the quiet university town, found myself and my personal affairs drawn into the vortex of the great world affairs. Whether it was my love for Ernest, or the clear sight he had given me of the society in which I lived, that made me a revolutionist, I know not. But a revolutionist I became. And I was plunged into a whirl of happenings that would have been inconceivable three short months before. The crisis in my own fortunes came simultaneously with great crises in society, First of all, father was discharged from the university. Oh, he was not technically discharged. His resignation was demanded. That was all. This in itself did not amount to much. Father, in fact, was delighted. He was especially delighted because his discharge had been precipitated by the publication of his book, Economics and Education. It clinched his argument, he contended. What better evidence could be advanced to prove that education was dominated by the capitalist class? But this proof never got anywhere. Nobody knew he had been forced to resign from the university. He was so eminent a scientist that such an announcement, coupled with the reason for his enforced resignation, would have created somewhat of a furor all over the world. The newspapers showered him with praise and honor, and commended him for having given up the drudgery of the lecture room in order to devote his whole time to scientific research. At first, father laughed. Then he became angry, tonic angry. Then came the suppression of his book. This suppression was performed secretly, so secretly that at first we could not comprehend. The publication of the book had immediately caused a bit of excitement in the country. Father had been politely abused in the capitalist press, the tone of the abuse being to the effect that it was a pity so great a scientist should leave his field and invade the realm of sociology, about which he knew nothing and wherein he had promptly become lost. This lasted for a week, while Father chuckled and said the book had touched a sore spot on capitalism. And then, abruptly, the newspapers and the critical magazines ceased saying anything about the book at all. Also, and with equal sadness, the book disappeared from the market. Not a copy was obtainable from any bookseller. Father wrote to the publishers and was informed that the plates had been accidentally injured. An unsatisfactory correspondence followed. Driven finally to an unequivocal stand, the publishers stated that they could not see their way to putting the book into type again, but that they were willing to relinquish their rights in it. "'And you won't find another publishing house in the country to touch it,' Ernest said. "'And if I were you, I'd hunt cover right now. "'You've merely got a foretaste of the iron heel.' "'But father was nothing if not a scientist. "'He never believed in jumping to conclusions. "'A laboratory experiment was no experiment "'if it were not carried through in all its details. "'So he patiently went the round of the publishing houses. "'They gave a multitude of excuses, "'but not one house would consider the book.' When father became convinced that the book had actually been suppressed, he tried to get the fact into the newspapers, but his communications were ignored. At a political meeting of the socialists, where many reporters were present, father saw his chance. He arose and related the history of the suppression of the book. He laughed next day when he read the newspapers, and then he grew angry to a degree that eliminated all tonic qualities. The papers made no mention of the book, but they misreported him beautifully. They twisted his words and phrases away from the context, and turned his subdued and controlled remarks into a howling anarchistic speech. It was done artfully. One instance in particular I remember. He had used the phrase, social revolution. The reporter merely dropped out social. This was sent out all over the country in an associated press dispatch, and from all over the country arose a cry of alarm. Father was branded as a nihilist and an anarchist. And in one cartoon that was copied widely, he was portrayed waving a red flag at the head of a mob of long-haired, wild-eyed men who bore in their hands torches, knives, and dynamite bombs. He was assailed terribly in the press, in long and abusive editorials for his anarchy, and hints were made of mental breakdown on his part. This behavior on the part of the capitalist press was nothing new, Ernest told us. It was the custom, he said, to send reporters to all the socialist meetings for the express purpose of misreporting and distorting what was said, in order to frighten the middle class away from any possible affiliation with the proletariat. And repeatedly, Ernest warned father to cease fighting and to take to cover. The socialist press of the country took up the fight, however, and throughout the reading portion of the working class it was known that the book had been suppressed. 
but this knowledge stopped with the working class. Next, the Appeal to Reason, a big socialist publishing house, arranged with father to bring out the book. Father was jubilant, but Ernest was alarmed. I'll tell you we are on the verge of the unknown, he insisted. Big things are happening secretly all around us. We can feel them. We do not know what they are, but they are there. The whole fabric of society is a tremble with them. Don't ask me. I don't know myself. But out of this flux of society something is about to crystallize. It is crystallizing now. The suppression of the book is a precipitation. How many books have been suppressed? We haven't the least idea. We are in the dark. We have no way of learning. Watch out next for the suppression of the socialist press and socialist publishing houses. I'm afraid it's coming. We are going to be throttled. Ernest had his hand on the pulse of events even more closely than the rest of the socialists, and within two days the first blow was struck. The appeal to reason was a weekly, and its regular circulation among the proletariat was 750,000. Also, it very frequently got out special editions of from two to five millions. These great editions were paid for and distributed by the small army of voluntary workers who had marshaled around the appeal. The first blow was aimed at these special editions, and it was a crushing one. By an arbitrary ruling of the post office, these editions were decided to be not the regular circulation of the paper, and for that reason were denied admission to the mails. A week later, the post office department ruled that the paper was seditious and barred it entirely from the mails. This was a fearful blow to the socialist propaganda. The appeal was desperate. It devised a plan of reaching its subscribers through the express companies, but they declined to handle it. This was the end of the appeal. But not quite. It prepared to go on with its book publishing. Twenty thousand copies of Father's book were in the bindery, and the presses were turning off more. And then, without warning, a mob arose one night, and, under a waving American flag, singing patriotic songs, set fire to the great plant of the appeal, and totally destroyed it. Now, Girard, Kansas, was a quiet, peaceable town. There had never been any labor troubles there. The appeal paid union wages, and, in fact, was the backbone of the town, giving employment to hundreds of men and women. It was not the citizens of Girard that composed the mob. This mob had risen up out of the earth, apparently, and to all intents and purposes, its work done, it had gone back into the earth. Ernest saw in the affair the most sinister import. The black hundreds are being organized in the United States, he said. This is the beginning. There will be more of it. The Iron Heel is getting bold. Note. The Black Hundreds were reactionary mobs organized by the perishing autocracy in the Russian Revolution. These reactionary groups attacked the revolutionary groups, and also at needed moments rioted and destroyed property so as to afford the autocracy the pretext of calling out the Cossacks. And so perished Father's book. We were to see much of the Black Hundreds as the days went by. Week by week, more of the socialist papers were barred from the mails, and in a number of instances the Black Hundreds destroyed the socialist presses. Of course, the newspapers of the land lived up to the reactionary policy of the ruling class, and the destroyed socialist press was misrepresented and vilified, while the Black Hundreds were represented as true patriots and saviors of society. So convincing was all this misrepresentation that even sincere ministers in the pulpit praised the Black Hundreds while regretting the necessity of violence. History was making fast. The fall elections were soon to occur, and Ernest was nominated by the Socialist Party to run for Congress. His chance for election was most favorable. The streetcar strike in San Francisco had been broken, and following upon it, the Teamsters' strike had been broken. These two defeats had been very disastrous to organized labor. The whole Waterfront Federation, along with its allies in the structural trades, had backed up the Teamsters, and all had smashed down ingloriously. It had been a bloody strike. The police had broken countless heads with their riot clubs, and the death list had been augmented by the turning loose of a machine gun on the strikers from the barns of the Marsden Special Delivery Company. In consequence, the men were sullen and vindictive. They wanted blood and revenge. Beaten on their chosen field, they were ripe to seek revenge by means of political action. They still maintained their labor organization, and this gave them strength in the political struggle that was on. Ernest's chance for election grew stronger and stronger. Day by day, unions and more unions voted their support to the socialists, until even Ernest laughed when the undertaker's assistants and the chicken pickers fell into line. Labor became mulish. 
While it packed the socialist meetings with mad enthusiasm, it was impervious to the wiles of the old party politicians. The old party orators were usually greeted with empty halls, though occasionally they encountered full halls, where they were so roughly handled that more than once it was necessary to call out the police reserves. History was making fast. The air was vibrant with things happening and impending. The country was on the verge of hard times, caused by a series of prosperous years wherein the difficulty of disposing abroad of the unconsumed surplus had become increasingly difficult. Industries were working short time, many great factories were standing idle against the time when the surplus should be gone, and wages were being cut right and left. Note. Under the capitalist regime, these periods of hard times were as inevitable as they were absurd. Prosperity always brought calamity. This, of course, was due to the excess of unconsumed profits that was piled up. Also, the great machinist strike had been broken. Two hundred thousand machinists, along with their five hundred thousand allies in the metalworking trades, had been defeated in as bloody a strike as had ever marred the United States. Pitched battles had been fought with the small armies of army strikebreakers, put in the field by the employers' associations. The black hundreds, appearing in scores of wide-scattered places, had destroyed property, and in consequence a hundred thousand regular soldiers of the United States had been called out to put a frightful end to the whole affair. A number of the labor leaders had been executed, many others had been sentenced to prison, while thousands of the rank and file of the strikers had been herded into bullpens and abominably treated by the soldiers. Note. Strike breakers. These were, in purpose and practice and everything except name, the private soldiers of the capitalists. They were thoroughly organized and well armed, and they were held in readiness to be hurled in special trains to any part of the country where labor went on strike or was locked out by the employers. Only those curious times could have given rise to the amazing spectacle of one, Farley, a notorious commander of strikebreakers who, in 1906, swept across the United States in special trains from New York to San Francisco with an army of 2,500 men, fully armed and equipped, to break a strike of the San Francisco streetcar men. Such an act was in direct violation of the laws of the land. The fact that this act and thousands of similar acts went unpunished goes to show how completely the judiciary was the creature of the plutocracy. Note. Bullpen. In a minor strike in Idaho, in the latter part of the 19th century, it happened that many of the strikers were confined in a bullpen by the troops. The practice and the name continued in the 20th century. The years of prosperity were now to be paid for. All markets were glutted. All markets were falling. And amidst the general crumble of prices, the price of labor crumbled fastest of all. The land was convulsed with industrial dissensions. Labor was striking here, there, and everywhere. And where it was not striking, it was being turned out by the capitalists. The papers were filled with tales of violence and blood, and through it all the black hundreds played their part. Riot, arson, and wanton destruction of property was their function, and well they performed it. The whole regular army was in the field, called there by the actions of the black hundreds. Note, the name only, and not the idea, was imported from Russia, the Black Hundreds were a development out of the secret agents of the capitalists, and their use arose in the labor struggles of the 19th century. There is no discussion of this. No less an authority of the times than Carol D. Wright, United States Commissioner of Labor, is responsible for the statement. From his book entitled The Battles of Labor is quoted the declaration that in some of the great historic strikes the employers themselves have instigated acts of violence that manufacturers have deliberately provoked strikes in order to get rid of surplus stock, and that freight cars have been burned by employers' agents during railroad strikes in order to increase disorder. It was out of these secret agents of the employers that the black hundreds arose, and it was they, in turn, that later became that terrible weapon of the oligarchy, the agent provocateur. Never had labor received such an all-round beating. The great captains of industry, the oligarchs, had for the first time thrown their full weight into the breach the struggling employers' associations had made. These associations were practically middle-class affairs, and now, compelled by hard times and crashing markets, and aided by the great captains of industry, they gave organized labor an awful and decisive defeat. It was an all-powerful alliance, but it was an alliance of the lion and the lamb, as the middle class was soon to learn. Labor was bloody and sullen, but crushed. Yet its defeat did not put an end to the hard times. The banks, themselves constituting one of the most important forces of the oligarchy, continued to call in credits. The Wall Street group turned the stock market into a maelstrom, where the values of all the land crumbled away almost to nothingness. And out of all the rack and ruin rose the form of the nascent oligarchy, imperturbable, indifferent, and sure. 
Its serenity and certitude was terrifying. Not only did it use its own vast power, but it used all the power of the United States Treasury to carry out its plans. Note. Wall Street. So named from a street in ancient New York, where was situated the stock exchange, and where the irrational organization of society permitted underhanded manipulation of all the industries of the country. The captains of industry had turned upon the middle class. The employers' associations that had helped the captains of industry to tear and rend labor were now torn and rent by their quondam allies. Amidst the crashing of the middlemen, the small businessmen and manufacturers, the trusts stood firm. Nay, the trusts did more than stand firm. They were active. They sowed wind and wind and ever more wind, for they alone knew how to reap the whirlwind and make a profit out of it. And such profits colossal prophets, strong enough themselves to weather the storm that was largely their own brewing, they turned loose and plundered the wrecks that floated about them. Values were pitifully and inconceivably shrunken, and the trusts added hugely to their holdings, even extending their enterprises into many new fields, and always at the expense of the middle class. Thus the summer of 1912 witnessed the virtual death thrust to the middle class. Even Ernest was astounded at the quickness with which it had been done. He shook his head ominously and looked forward without hope to the fall elections. "'It's no use,' he said. "'We are beaten. The Iron Heel is here. I had hoped for a peaceable victory at the ballot box. I was wrong. Wixon was right. We shall be robbed of our few remaining liberties. The Iron Heel will walk upon our faces. Nothing remains but a bloody revolution of the working class. Of course we will win.' But I shudder to think of it. And from then on Ernest pinned his faith in revolution. In this he was in advance of his party. His fellow socialists could not agree with him. They still insisted that victory could be gained through the elections. It was not that they were stunned. They were too cool-headed and courageous for that. They were merely incredulous. That was all. Ernest could not get them seriously to fear the coming of the oligarchy. They were stirred by him, but they were too sure of their own strength. There was no room in their theoretical social evolution for an oligarchy. Therefore the oligarchy could not be. "'We'll send you to Congress, and it will be all right,' they told him at one of our secret meetings. "'And when they take me out of Congress,' Ernest replied coldly, "'and put me against the wall, and blow my brains out, what then?' "'Then we'll rise in our might,' A dozen voices answered at once. "'Then you'll welter in your gore,' was his retort. "'I've heard that song sung by the middle class, and where is it now in its might?' End of chapter 10 Recording by Matt Saw, Montreal, mattsaw.org